Okay, in terms of announcements, the only thing that I'm aware of is to continue to announce about the DM2 uh, training that will be covering the life of Christ, Part 1, and that will begin on September the 18th. That's a Thursday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It will continue that night, I believe, until about 9.30, and then uh, all day Friday and all day Saturday. And I encourage you again to uh, make time, if you possibly can, out of your schedule uh, for that, that conference. It will benefit you in a number of ways, though not the least of which is it will help give you a framework for the life of Christ that will, uh, that will also help you as we go through our study, our study in Matthew. I don't think, Alan, is there anything else? Nope, I, don't, I didn't think there was. Okay. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer so you can make sure that you are in fellowship, which simply means that uh, when we sin, we're out of fellowship, that ongoing enjoyment of our uh, abiding in Christ, our fellowship with God is broken. We're no longer walking by the Spirit, but we're walking according to the sin nature. And so by confessing our sins to God the Father, we're immediately forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. We are restored to to walking by the Spirit so we can enjoy our fellowship with God. And so we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so you can make sure you're spiritually prepared, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Fathers, we come before you this evening. We're mindful of situations in this world that seem quite chaotic and out of control. Situations, especially in the Middle East, which has often been the graveyard of empires, as we see the rise of this uh, horrible group, uh, ISIS, as well as the uh, parallel development uh, we see in Israel with the ongoing fighting with Hamas. And Father, we pray that you would give wisdom to the leaders of Israel and wisdom to the leaders in the U.S. as to how to handle uh, these situations. Uh, Father, we pray especially for those who are missionaries who are working in these areas, that they might uh, be protected, that you might give them courage and strength to uh, be a ministry to those in, who are in need. And Father, we pray too for those Christians who are uh, in the and near ISIS, those who have been driven from their homes, lost everything that they have, those who are working with various humanitarian groups, we pray that they might be faithful in presenting the only real hope, which is Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for us as this congregation that we might have a, a view that goes beyond the walls of this congregation to the impact of your word uh, throughout the world, and that it is only through the impact of individual believers who are studying the word and applying it as they move out from within their their narrow the narrow areas of our life into the broader applications in terms of of our uh, local culture the culture of our nations and beyond that we are used by you as a light light of the world our father we pray you challenge us with your word this evening as we study it that we might have hope and strength from the scriptures and we pray this in Christ's name Amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which will be our key passage that we will begin with this evening. And we're looking at the question, why I believe in the rapture. This question of the rapture is really a question of timing, but we have to first of all understand what it is, and then we have to understand when it will take place. That's been a matter of debate. Uh, over the last 
uh, almost 200 years, many people today still erroneously think that John Nelson Darby came up with the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. That is a rapture of the church that comes prior to the seven-year tribulation, also known as the time of, of Jacob's wrath, also known uh, as the uh, Daniel's 70th week. It's a seven-year period that begins not with the rapture, as we will see time and again, but it begins with the signing of a covenant between the Antichrist and Israel. And that kicks off the clock, and as the clock goes forward, it will only go seven years, and then the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. But before that happens, this event known as the rapture, sometimes it's called the secret rapture, now, I never, I didn't grow up learning that term secret rapture. I usually only hear opponents use that term secret rapture. But actually, that term was used by dispensationalists back in the 19th century. And it, it, it came out of part of the culture in which John Nelson Darby uh, operated. He was originally ordained as an Anglican uh, clergyman. He became t- quite disenchanted with the Anglican church and and left it and was one of the original founders of a group known as the Plymouth Brethren. And they believed that that as uh, the church age continued and came closer and closer to end times, that there would be an, an increase of apostasy so that uh, there would be fewer and fewer believers on the earth, fewer and fewer church age believers. And so when the rapture occurred, there wouldn't be many left, and when they disappeared, it wouldn't be that noticed, so it was a secret rapture. That's what they meant by that, but often our opponents use that, and uh, I don't know that it will be secret or not. I think that, um, but it will be very obvious that there are believers who are gone. If the, if the rapture were to occur today, I think it would cause great chaos in the world. Uh, when I was a kid, I heard that, that uh, there, was, there was at least one airline that had a uh, president who was a believer who wouldn't allow two Christians to fly in a cockpit together. I don't know if that was true or not, but I heard that a number of times. And that was back in the 50s. Nowadays, nobody would know. Uh, most most uh, air, air, airline executives probably don't have a clue. But um, but that was that was true. Now you're going to have a lot of accidents that take place, a lot of chaos that takes place in the United States. We still have a huge number of significant uh, captains of industry, officers in the military, politicians uh, in government who are believers who would no longer be here, and this would cause tremendous calamity. And I believe that that in other governments there are those who are believers, and in many businesses around the world there are those who are believers. We don't know the extent of that, but it's very possible that if the rapture were to occur today that it would cause worldwide chaos, and I think that that is very likely, and that it is into the vacuum of leadership that that occurs during that chaos that the Antichrist, a previously, at that time, a previously unknown person, he certainly isn't identified as the Antichrist until after he signs that treaty with, with Israel. When the Antichrist signs that treaty with Israel, that's the first sign, first clear indication that that he's the Antichrist. Before that, we won't know. There's always a lot of speculation as to who the Antichrist might be. And it's always uh, helpful to remember that that Satan is no more informed about the, uh, the timing of the rapture than any of us. Uh, it's God, only God the Father has access to that information. Only God the Father knows that information. Jesus said that it was only for the Father to know. Uh, Obviously, he's omniscient, and he would know, but it's not part of his role uh, to disclose that or be involved in that decision as a second person of the Trinity. That was the domain of God the Father. And so if Satan is absolutely ignorant of the timing of the rapture, that means that Satan has to be ready at any moment to have an Antichrist candidate in place. And that means that back in the early 1800s, late 1700s, when Christians thought it might be Napoleon, it might have been. If uh, later on in the 19th century, if it was Bismarck, 
It might have been. Satan had somebody in place. It could possibly have been Hitler. It could have been any number of candidates that have been suggested because Satan always had to have somebody who would fit that profile who he could use to move into that position. And so at any time in history, people could certainly look around and go, "Ah, maybe it could be so-and-so. And maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. Who knows? Because God has not uh, authorized the rapture yet. So we're looking at this doctrine of the rapture, which is important for a number of reasons, and I just want to go through uh, parts of the overview. Now, here's the chart. I've animated it the last couple of weeks, and this is just the overview of the dispensations and ages. We have the two broad ages in the Old Testament, the age of the Gentiles up to the Tower of Babel, actually to the call of Abraham, And then the age of Israel, those ages are subdivided into administrative periods, administrations of God, uh, the dispensation of perfect environment during the Garden of Eden, the dispensation of conscience from the Garden of Eden to the Noahic flood, the dispensation of human government from the flood to the call of Abraham, the dispensation of patriarchs, that's the first dispensation, the age of Israel, from Abraham to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, and then the dispensation of the Mosaic law, which extends all the way to the cross because it's the cross that's the end of the law. But what we have at the end of that dispensation is sort of a hinge dispensation. It's got significant distinctives, and that's the period of Christ's public ministry on the earth. So I identify that as a distinct dispensation. It's a hinge dispensation. It fulfills the law, looking to the past, but Jesus also sets the precedent for the spiritual life of the church age. And the church age begins uh, uh, 50 days after the cross at the day of Pentecost in A.D. uh, 33 and will end with the rapture of the church that's what ends. What, what is distinctive in the church age is the baptism by the Holy Spirit and the role of God the Holy Spirit in empowering the spiritual life of church age believers. Following the rapture, not the next day, but certainly maybe the next week, the next month, maybe even the next year or decade, the tribulation will begin. We don't know how much time Uh, will take place in that intervening period. There was certainly a 50-day period. Christ is the end of the law at the cross. But the church age doesn't begin for 50 days at the day of Pentecost. So there's a 50-day gap there when there's a uh, transition from one dispensation to another. And so there's certainly going to be some kind of transition between the end of the church age and the beginning of the tribulation. So that's what we're we're looking at in terms of the yes. Could, could you go back to that slide, please? Sure. Will you please change that to white font on Messianic age? I think that's what it says. On yeah, Messianic age. You've been showing this for a while, and nobody can read that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um. Yeah, the, somehow that got darker in the background than... That's a great slide. Good. I didn't come up with it. I stole it. <laughs> Pastors are great plagiarists. I modified it. It's distinctive enough for me. Why I believe in the pre-trib rapture. What's the rapture? And when is the rapture? These are the two key questions that we need to address. Uh, we looked last time at what is the rapture and defined it as now this is what's important the translation of all living believers from the earth at the end of the church age immediately following the resurrection of all dead church age believers there's a distinction in the text those who are dead in Christ will rise from the dead then we who are alive and remain will be caught up that's the word for rapture there harpazo So the caught up, the rapture word, technically applies only to those who are alive and remain. The dead in Christ will rise first. That's the term for resurrection. So if we want to be technical, 
re- the, the dead in Christ are resurrected when the Lord returns in the air, and those who are alive are raptured. Now, most people don't think precisely enough for that to make a whole lot of difference, and it'll fly right past them. But technically, in the, in the Scripture, the rapture, that word is applied only to that which happens to the, those who are alive and remain. This is the word I just mentioned here in terms of <coughs> rapture vocabulary, harpazo, and it means to be caught up. It means to seize upon something with force or to snatch up. It's a word that is often used of, of a thief coming and stealing something. It's something unexpected. It's something sudden. It's something that happens quickly. And this is used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. The Greek word harpazo was translated by Jerome. Jerome was one of the early church fathers in the uh, 3rd century to 4th century who's translating the, uh, new, the, uh, both, uh, translated both the Old Testament and New Testament into Latin. And the Latin word that he used to translate harpazo was the Latin word rapto, which means, which is the basis for our word rapture. Every now and then you'll hear somebody say, oh, I don't believe in the rapture. Prove it. That word's not used in the Bible. It is. It's used in the Latin Bible. It's not used in your English Bible, but it's that that word meaning to be caught up uh, to be with the Lord in the air. Now, there's, there's a number of passages that allude to the rapture. There are, I think, three key passages that really focus us on on the rapture. And the foundation passage is the one in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 13 through 18. Now, Paul begins by saying, we do not want you to be uninformed brethren. We don't want you to be ignorant. We don't want you to not understand the issues. Paul was only in uh, Thessalonica for a short time, two to three months. Some scholars believe it was maybe only as little as six weeks. I think it was a little longer than that, uh, but certainly not much longer than, than, uh, than three or four uh, months. And clearly during that three or four month period, he taught the, these new believers in Thessalonica about future things. We live in an era today partly influenced by the um, holy agnosticism of postmodern influence in the church, that there are things that we just can't be certain about in the Bible. Many people, that you might even hear that, well, we can't really know for sure about prophecy, or we can't know for sure about the sign gifts, that's a favorite one today, or we really can't know, we just need to be involved in doing what Jesus said to do. But doing what Jesus said to do is predicated upon understanding correctly what Jesus said to do. And that means that the Bible had to have been written uh, with the understanding from God that we would be able to correctly understand what he's communicating to us. God did not cloud his word or obfuscate his word for church-age believers. It may take us a little time and study and effort to come to an understanding of the truth, but postmodernism has so influence the thinking of people in our culture that that especially younger people but it affected older people as well as that we can't really know these things and often that's an excuse for intellectually and theologically lazy people who just don't want to do the homework and sometimes it's theologically and spiritually fearful people who are afraid that that their safe secure theological system might be challenged by the understanding of the word, and so they would rather live in in sort of a fog of nebulosity rather than getting into the details of the text. But Paul makes a statement between verses 13 and 18, which is very specific, and its purpose is seen in the last verse in verse 18. He says, "...therefore comfort one another with these words." So he understood that what he was saying in this, in this section was something that would bring great comfort to people whose loved ones, who were believers in Jesus Christ, 
had died physically, and they were concerned about what happened to them and what would happen to their bodies and their souls in in the future. So this was designed to give comfort to people at the time of loss. This is a great passage to use, uh, therefore, at a time of loss, at a funeral, at a memorial service, in talking to someone who has experienced a, a, a death in the family, because this helps us to understand something about grief. Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed brethren, clearly talking to believers, about those who are asleep. And as I pointed out last time, the word asleep indicates a a, um, a euphemism for Christians who have died. It's not talking about the Jehovah's Witness doctrine of soul sleep, where the soul just sort of goes into a a coma-like state until Jesus returns, Because we know from Scripture that when we're absent from the body, we're face to face with the Lord. And when Jesus returns, uh, those who have died physically will return with him, which is what this passage teaches. So the focus of this passage is on comfort to those who would be going through grief at the time of physical loss. And the foundation for it is in the gospel. Verse 14, if we believe Jesus died and rose again... Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, the point that he is making here, and I I stress this, is if, if we believe Jesus died and rose again, the emphasis is on the resurrection. If we believe in the resurrection of Christ, then... We should believe in the physical bodily resurrection of believers. He's not giving us the content of the gospel at this point. There's nothing here talking about the content of the gospel. He's saying, if we as Christians believe that Christ died for our sins and he rose again, if we have a belief in the, in the physical bodily resurrection of Christ, then the, then the application of that to us is that we should also believe in the physical bodily resurrection of, of believers. So if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that uh, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Explanation, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, this is a foundation, so we want to take a little time in understanding this. As I stated already, the purpose of this section is to encourage believers in relation to the death of Christian loved ones. The, this is not a passage where Paul is giving us primarily a focus on eschatology or a focus on, uh, on, the, on the chronology of events at end times. He is very pastoral in his concern here. He is concerned that people are comforted at the time of grief. And what comforts people at the time of grief is understanding reality understanding truth. And when we understand that death is simply a temporary phase that believers go through, and it's their entry point into eternity, and that there is a certain procedure that will take place eventually where their immaterial soul and spirit will be reunited with a resurrection body, then we can have hope and confidence and not have a grief that leads to to darkness and despair. We can in turn have, we have loss because we're missing somebody. It's as if a dear friend has left us and they've moved to the other side of the planet and we know we will probably never see them again in this life. But they're still alive. And we will see them again eventually. So the purpose is to encourage believers. So he reminds them of what he had already taught them. That's important. He's already taught this. They didn't quite get it the first time, maybe not even the second time. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have not gotten some of the things I've taught 10, 15, 20, 30 times. (laughs) One honest soul in the back. 
Yes, it takes time to think through uh, these things. So he's got to remind them again, and it's from a position of comfort. Now, another thing to note here as we look at the passage is that uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. Now, that's an important verse there because that indicates that he's already taught them. And he's taught them about something called the times and the seasons. And this use of this phrase shows a change from the answer that Jesus gave his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Twenty years earlier, just before the ascension, Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. He used the same words in the Greek. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. So he's talking to his 11 disciples at that point and says, it's not for you to know these things. 20 years later, Paul is talking to Thessalonian believers, and he says, I don't need to tell you anything more about the times and the seasons because you already know this. So within that 20-year gap, something changed. What changed was the beginning of the church. And what Jesus was essentially saying to his disciples is, Now's not the time for y'all to know and to understand this. This will be naturally unveiled and disclosed to you over the progress of Revelation during the next 20 years, especially by uh, Saul of Tarsus, who's going to come along, and he will be given uh, most of the revelation related to this mystery doctrine. But right now in 33 AD, you boys don't need to know this. 20 years from now... You're going to have all your questions answered via this uh, coming uh, revelation. So that sets the time frame here. We are to know about eschatology. We are to know about the scripture. In fact, one out of every, uh, I think it's one out out of every six or seven verses, 18% of of the Bible relates to unfulfilled prophecy. Interesting. And people say, well, we don't need to know Bible. Okay, well, let's just take our little scalpels out and cut out 18% of the Bible. We don't really need to know it. If God thought we needed to know it and revealed it to us, then this is an important aspect of our of our understanding of our study. So, he gives a purpose for his explanation in verse 13 that we should be comforted, that we may not grieve, that we may not sorrow. But he's not saying don't sorrow. One thing I always bring out in memorial services and funerals is that grief is natural in a fallen world. It's the result of living in a fallen world and experiencing death because God did not design uh, mankind to experience death. It's not normal. See, normal is what, the, what was part of the experience of Adam and Eve before the fall. That was normal. From the moment that Adam ate that fruit, we've been living in an abnormal creation. We've been living in a creation that is subnormal, a creation that is subject to God's judgment and the corruption of sin. So that we don't know what normal is because we, all we've ever experienced is that which is subnormal. And death and disease and suffering and war and famine and drought and hurricanes and economic recessions and depressions are all subnormal. They're all the result of living in a post-fall world, in a world governed by corruption, and we have to learn how to live in such a world by depending upon God. So we recognize that we grieve. Every time there's some, someone dies, we recognize this is a call to remind us about the fall. This is something God has put in our soul. We experience that loss. We, we say deep in our soul, maybe consciously, maybe, maybe not, this should not be happening. This is not right. My loved one shouldn't be taken from me like this. 
My friend should not be gone. This, there's, this just isn't right. Of course, it's not right. That's the whole point, is that God has put this little reminder in the souls of all of us that when things like this happen, when we see something like that horrible beheading of the uh, journalists this last week by ISIS, we go, this is horrible, this isn't right. You're exactly right. It is a reminder that we live in a fallen world, and it's been corrupted by sin. And as Christians, when we talk to people, this is something that we ought to use as a hook in order to uh, get their attention to talk about the gospel. When, when somebody loses someone in death and, um, and they're going through grief, we can find out ways to gently uh, take them through the gospel, that, that the reason we're experiencing this kind of loss is because this is not what God intended. Uh, this is the result of living in Satan's world. And so uh, what what... Paul is saying here is not that we don't grieve, but it's don't we don't grieve like those who live in a hopeless world of darkness and despair with no comprehension of a future, an eternity, and a personal God who has redeemed them from their sins. We live in a world where there is hope, but we will grieve. That is a normal uh, response to, to loss. This introduction, I find, is very helpful. As I've been thinking through in my mind the last few weeks as we've been talking about the rapture, I've been reflecting upon what Scripture teaches about the rapture. I always try, each time I go back through something again, is to think it through in some different ways and try to probe the Scriptures for for some different perspectives. One of the things that we often do not do, I try to do as much as I can, but most of us do not do this, is to look at the scriptures holistically. Don't just look, don't just drill down microscopically on uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, but look at how this fits within the context of not only the Pauline epistles in the New Testament, but, but all of Scripture. How does the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture fit within the panorama of God's plan, which is essentially what we're talking about in our, in our whole study? We're looking at God's plan for the ages. Well, how does the rapture fit into this? And as I was reflecting upon this, I went back to this particular verse and focused on the fact that this is a verse in the New Testament that is driving our attention down to the doctrine of suffering. That's what's really referenced here in terms of grief, is the doctrine of suffering. Now let me ask you a question. What is the book in the Bible that God revealed that deals with the doctrine of suffering? That is its primary uh, focus. That's right, Job. Job, I believe, was the very first book written in the Old Testament. Job is written, there's no mention of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's no mention of the Jews, there's no mention of Jerusalem, the promised land, Canaan, any of those things. I believe that Job is written roughly about the same time as in the lifespan of either Abraham or Isaac. Job is not Jewish. Job is a Gentile. And Job is, the, the book of Job itself answers this question of why is there undeserved suffering? And where does it drive us in the very, very first chapter? It drives us to the throne of God and the involvement of Satan and the angels in human history. And Satan shows up during a regular meeting with God, with the other angels, both fallen and elect. And uh, God says, well, have you looked at my servant Job? Now, a lot of us would say, you know, Lord, please don't, don't, don't mention my name in that context. I'd be, I'd be a lot happier if you just, just, you know, if I'm okay, just say, well done, good and faithful servant, and kind of pull a curtain around me, but don't point me out like you did with Job. And he points out Job, and uh, Satan's answer is basically, well, you're so good to him, no wonder he likes you. Just take away all the, all the bennies. Take away all the goodies and the blessings and everything, and then we'll just see if if Job is going to still worship you, and if he'll he'll curse you. And so, through various stages that we we've studied, Job loses his children. He lo- loses a lot of his possessions. He loses his his flocks and his sheep. He loses almost everything except his lovely wife, who tells him basically, you know, curse God and die. And three friends. 
who are operating on very common assumptions about why we suffer. We suffer because you've sinned. You're not really that righteous. But see, from the very beginning, God emphasized to Satan, have you considered my righteous servant Job? He's righteous. There's nothing in Job's life that is a cause of all of this suffering. There are, there are other reasons. And so we should ask the question, why would it be that at the very beginning of human, uh, uh, not the beginning of human history, but the beginning of Revelation, beginning of the Bible, that the first thing God talks about is how to handle suffering. Because suffering is so universal, it is so endemic to, to the human experience, that this is the very first thing that's answered. And, and what Job wants is to, to know is, can I really trust God to do the right thing and to bring about justice if not in my life, over the course of time. And what God is, provides us in the Scripture is, is a perspective where we think that things that are unjust in our lives need to be rectified today. If not today, well, God, you certainly need to straighten this out by tomorrow. And if we've lived a little bit, we know it doesn't quite work that way. And what the Scripture gives us is a perspective that they, these things may not be reconciled by God until we get into the judgment stages at the end of history. And only then will God execute justice for us. And this is a picture that we see, that, that history is driving uh, toward a, a, a final solution to the whole problem of evil and sin. But God is working this out over a period of thousands of years. And when it all comes to a conclusion, he will bring about the establishment of righteousness upon the earth. And at the end of history, at the end of the church age, we have the rapture. And the rapture removes the body of Christ from the earth. And then what happens to them? The first judgment takes place. We're evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. And the bride of Christ, which is a term for the church, is going to be purified and prepared for our position to rule and reign with, with Christ during the kingdom. Following the judgment seat of Christ, we studied this in Romans, I mean, excuse me, in Revelation 4 and 5, where the uh, 24 elders who are representatives of the church cast their crowns, their Stephanos crowns, not their diademos crowns. A diademos crown is a crown of royalty. A Stephanos crown is a reward crown. They cast the, their reward crowns before the Lord Jesus Christ. This is before chapter 6 when Jesus takes the first seal off of the scroll and begins the judgments in the first half of the tribulation. That tells us that these 24 elders who show up before the throne of God in Revelation 4 and 5 are already raptured and rewarded. Judgment seat of Christ has taken place at this time, and they are there in the, in the throne room of God when the, the quest goes out, the search goes out to find someone worthy to take the scroll. And so there's this judgment that takes place. And in terms of human time, it takes place in a flash of an instant. Uh, after the rapture, we are evaluated and rewarded. And this prepares us for, for the future. And then we have this judgment that takes place on the earth of the tribulation that is going to culminate in a, in a second half of the tribulation when the demons are cast out of heaven, Satan is cast out of heaven to the earth, and I believe they, when we studied this in, in the uh, lengthy study we did on Revelation, the, the fallen angels will become visible. I believe the elect angels are as well. The angels become visible, and God is going to bring human history to a close at the second coming of Christ, and Human beings as well as angels are all judged. So it's at the end of the tribulation that Old Testament saints are judged. We'll see in this passage that the rapture is for those who are dead in Christ. That doesn't include Old Testament saints. They're not in Christ. Old Testament saints are raptured at the end of the tribulation. Tribulation martyrs who die during the tribulation will be raptured, I mean, will be um, 
resurrected at the end of the tribulation period. Those groups will be judged. The surviving Gentiles and surviving Jews will be judged at the sheep and the goat judgment. Those who are believers will go into the millennial kingdom uh, under the reign of iron, the reign of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And so this is when you see the beginning of God working out his justice in terms of all of the evil that has taken place in human history, and that will eventually culminate in the final judgment, which is the great white throne judgment that comes at the end of the millennial kingdom. So when we step back and we see the panorama here, uh, we see that what God is doing in, in throughout history is working out the solution to this problem of injustice as a result of Adam's sin and ultimately the result of Satan's sin, and that he's doing certain things within the human race with believers and with the angels that must be done in order to prepare us for this final reconciliation of justice that occurs before his throne. So this sort of drives us back to an understanding of this panorama of the doctrine of suffering, that we may not have all things made right in this life, but they will be made right eventually, and God will bring that that justice to bear. So verse 13 drives us to the doctrine of of suffering and tells us that that there's a distinction between believers and unbelievers, between Christians and non-Christians, is that we have a hope. And hope in Scripture is not just sort of a wishful optimism, but it is a confident expectation. There are many unbelievers who have a false hope, They've deluded themselves in one way or another. They have, they have imbibed of a fantasy that somehow there's some afterlife and everything will be good and everything will be wonderful and I'll be reunited. My But they have no basis for this. They have no foundation. It is just a wish and a hope that is not based on anything other than the alternative is what they're trying to suppress. The alternative that there is a just God who will demand that his justice be satisfied. He may be a loving God, but he, his love works with his justice, and his justice does not operate at the expense of his love, but he can't compromise either. And so in his love, he's provided the perfect solution for eternity. And in his justice, if that solution is rejected, then there will be eternal, eternal condemnation. Now, the basis for our future hope, the basis for our confident hope is described in verse 14. For if we believe, and it's a first-class condition indicating that that he's assuming that this is true for all of his readers, if, and we could almost translate it since, although that's not the best use or the best way to translate most first-class conditions, here I guess I think it, it, it would fit, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And those two things must be taken together. He's not talking about just the gospel here. He's really emphasizing, we believe there's a physical bodily resurrection. If you believe in a physical bodily resurrection, that means that we have, that's our basis for believing that we too will be uh, physically, bodily raised from the dead. So that's what he's stating here. If we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And so what he is stating here is that Jesus Christ's resurrection, which is called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, uh, this is, uh, he's the first fruits, and then we come later, and we will be resurrected. Now, those who have already died are with Jesus. Notice God The Father is the one who is in charge. This is important. God the Father's mentioned here and Jesus is mentioned. God the Father's role is he's in charge. He will bring with him, with Jesus. So God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That is, they, they, they died physically and they're with Jesus. That's an important thing to know. They are with him when he begins to descend. They are already with him. Their soul and the spirit is with him. But their physical body hasn't been 
taken from the grave yet. So it shows us that they are already uh, with the Lord. I believe they have an interim body. Uh, an interim body goes back to Luke chapter, I believe it's chapter 16, when you have the episode with Lazarus and the rich man. When Lazarus the beggar dies, he goes to Abraham's bosom or paradise. When the rich man dies, he is not a believer. He goes to a place called torments. And he is moaning and groaning and complaining to Abraham that he's going through so much pain. And he, he wants, he says, please let Lazarus take his finger and stick it in the water and put some water on my tongue. So he's clearly talking about, <coughs> he's clearly talking about some sort of, of, uh, a physical sensory. It's not a corporeal body like we have, but it's some sort of intermediate body that definitely can feel plain, pain and pleasure because the cool water on the tip of his tongue would bring pleasure uh, in spite of the pain that he's going through. So there's some sort of interim body, but it is not a resurrection body. And so we, as those who are dead in Christ, will... Um, come with Jesus in their inner body. They haven't received their resurrection body yet. In verse 15 through 17, we have an ex explanation of the dynamics of what takes place at the rapture when that occurs. And what this tells us is that there are a series of events that take place in a specific order when Jesus returns at the rapture. Notice he returns in the clouds, he doesn't return to the earth. That's important. Paul says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. When he says by the word of the Lord, that means that he's referencing some sort of revelation from Jesus. And I believe this goes back to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, when Jesus said that he is uh, going to go uh, to his father's house and that he is going to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. And that he is comforting them in John 14, 1 through 3, just as Paul is providing comfort here in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. So Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. So that means, what he is saying here is we don't go up first. Those who have fallen asleep, that is those who have died in Christ, they'll go up first and we go up just a split second, a nanosecond later. Then he describes this in verse 16. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Three things happen simultaneously. The, uh, first, the Lord descends. Second, there's three things that occur simultaneously. There's a shout or a command. There's the voice of the archangel. And then third, there is the blast on the trumpet of God. At that sound, those three signals that happen simultaneously, the dead in Christ, not all the dead, not all dead believers, but only the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, clear chronological term, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So let's look at this. First we see that the Lord will descend from heaven. In verse 16, he descends from heaven. Now that's important because when he descends from heaven, we know that he has been in heaven. There's a point to make uh, that I'm making there. He has been in heaven. That's going to be important when we compare this with John chapter 14. So he's been in heaven, and then he's going to descend first, and then this, this noise. So back to verse... Um, uh, verse 16, we'll just continue here. The Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with this shout. So he's coming from heaven, and then after that, there's a shout. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, 
we read that we are to wait for his son from heaven. Jesus is currently in heaven. He ascended to heaven, as we see in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 9. He ascends, 9 and 10, he ascends to heaven. We're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That term, wrath to come, is also a term here in that verse for the tribulation that we will be rescued. It's not sozo, it's ruamai, indicating a physical rescue from a disastrous situation. John 13, 3, we read, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. It's important. I'm really stressing. We have to understand the Bible makes a really big point about Jesus going to heaven and coming from heaven. And where are we going to go? We're going to go to heaven. Now, that's not our forever domain, but we're going to go to heaven, not back to the earth. John 14, 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Where is he coming from? Heaven. Where is he taking us? Heaven. In a post-trib rapture view, Jesus comes down. We meet him halfway in the clouds and continue to come to the earth. Jesus is saying that I'm coming from heaven and taking you where I have been, back in heaven. So this shows that it can't be a pre, I mean, a post-trib rapture view because Jesus doesn't go back to heaven at a post-trib rapture. He comes to the earth. We know he's in heaven. Act Psalm 110.1, he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father until... God makes his enemies his footstool, and he is given the kingdom, in, which is referenced in Daniel chapter 7, when the Son of Man comes. Acts 2.33, he's exalted to the right hand of God the Father, and then there are other references in Acts 5.31, Colossians 3.1, Hebrews 8.1, Hebrews 10.12, and 12.2, as well as Revelation 3.21, where he's sitting on the throne of God. Jesus is in heaven. So he descends from heaven with a shout. That's the word kaluzma, which means a command. He is giving a command at that time, something like rise or raise up, something like that. He is calling the dead in Christ, those bodies who are lying in the grave, to come forth from the grave, and instantly, in a nanosecond, they will be transformed for, from corruption to incorruption, from mortal to immortality, and then they are united instantly with the soul and spirit of the person who has trusted in Christ. That is when the dead in Christ rise first, they're reunited with their uh, now uh, resurrection body, and they will be with the Lord. So there's a shout, uh, there's a voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. Now, John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus said, Don't marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice. That's the shout. And they shall come forth, those who do good deeds to uh, resurrection of life, those who commit the evil deeds to resurrection of judgment. Revelation 4, 1, after these things Paul says in Revelation 2 and 3, he describes the churches. But in Revelation 4, there's a shift and, and I believe this is an allusion to the rapture. And John says, after these things, that's Revelation 2 and 3, he says, I behold, and behold, the door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet. This is the only reference to the rapture in Revelation. The sound of a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you what, may, what must take place after these things. So this depicts... I'm not saying this is the rapture, but this depicts that what will happen at the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53 gives us the how. Behold, I tell you a mystery, a previously unrevealed truth. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 60, one sixty-fourth of a second, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, not the last trumpet in Revelation, in the tribulation, but the last trumpet of the church age, the trumpet that a trumpet was used to signal a significant event. And this is the signal of the end of the church age. It is not one of the seven trumpets that we see in, in Revelation, it, it, because the seventh trumpet is, contains seven bowl judgments. The trumpet will... 
uh, sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. That's not what happens with the seventh trumpet in Revelation. When the seventh trumpet blasts, it reveals seven bold judgments, not the resurrection of the dead. So this is a picture of the rapture. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality. So here's the order of events. They happen very quickly in, in, in quick succession. The Lord descends from heaven and he's in the clouds. Three simultaneous audible events take place. There's a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. Only church age believers and then a nanosecond later, living church age believers are raptured to meet the Lord in the air. And then he concludes, thus we shall always be with the Lord. So where does the Lord go? In a pre-trib rapture scenario, he goes back to heaven. This is where he is building or preparing our temporary dwelling places now. If the Lord were to bring the church with him back to the earth, then why is he wasting his time building these abodes for us in heaven, according to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3? In John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Again, notice he's comforting them. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Now, some of you may not like that because it doesn't have quite the ring of the King James mansions, but actually the Greek word doesn't mean mansions. We think of mansions, we're driving down River Oaks Boulevard looking at all of those stately homes and all of their lawns, and that's a misunderstanding because the, the English word mansion has gone through an evolution of meaning. And its original meaning, coming out of the Latin, was a dwelling place. It's come to mean a certain kind of sumptuous dwelling place, but that's not what it meant in the Latin or what the original Greek means. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Where did Jesus go? I've been, I've been pounding this all night. Where did Jesus go? He went to heaven. What's he doing in heaven? He's preparing a place for us. So it doesn't fit for us to meet him halfway up and come back to the earth because then we miss out on whatever it is he's prepared for us. This is why John 14, 1 through 3 is clearly a pre-trib rapture passage. So as if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this particular passage is that uh, there was a study done by a Mennonite commentator on Revelation by the name of J.B. Smith, and he noted that there are eight striking parallels in vocabulary between uh, John 14, 1 through 3, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Eight striking parallels. When he compared the vocabulary of the uh, two passages related to the second coming in Revelation 19, 11, and 12, and other passages, he found no, no comparison. So there's no comparison between the vocabulary in 1 Thess 4. I misstated that a minute ago. Between, if you look at two passages, 1 Thess 4, John 14, you compare them... There's eight commonalities in terms of vocabulary. If you compare either one of those two with Revelation 19, the second coming passage in Revelation 19, 11, and 12, neither John 14 or 1 Thess 4 have any similarities of vocabulary with Revelation 19. That's really interesting. What we see is that these eight similarities also occur in the same order in John 14, 1 through 3, as they do in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. You think that's just happened that way? Just coincidence? Maybe Paul got out his, his uh, Apple iPad 
and started uh, doing vocabulary searches on the uh, Greek text and saying, okay, we have these words, I'm going to match that. I'm not sure it worked that way. So what do we have? First of all, both passages focus on providing comfort. They're both designed to comfort those who are in a state of anxiety or grief. Secondly, both passages emphasize belief in Christ as the key issue, that they are, you have believed in me. So Jesus is emphasizing uh, that belief in John chapter 14. I'm going to flip in my Bible back to John chapter 14. Third thing is both passages focus on God the Father and Jesus the Son of God. In both passages, both the Father and the Son are involved. I pointed that out in First Thess 4.14, that God will bring them, that is the dead in Christ, with him. Okay? So both the Father and the Son are involved in both passages. Fourth, both passages instruct their audience. In John 14.2, Jesus says, I would have told you. In First Thessalonians 4.15, Paul says, I say to you. So, uh, you have belief. Verse 1 says, "Believe you believe in God, believe also in me. Both passages talk about the Father and the Son. Both passages instruct their audience that this is divine revelation. Fifth point, the return of Jesus is mentioned in, in both. Both passages uh, mention the return of Jesus, that he's coming back. Uh, John and John, Jesus says, he will receive them. Jesus says, I will go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, 4, we are caught up to be together with him in the clouds. And then finally, in both passages, believers continue to be with the Lord after that event. That is striking. This is remarkable. John 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4 are parallel passages. John 14 is clearly talking about the rapture, as is John, um, John 14. In Acts 1.11, G- uh, as Jesus ascends, uh, the angels that are there say to the disciples, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So that's our destiny. This is why early dispensationalists like Darby emphasized that the church was a heavenly people with a heavenly destiny, whereas Israel was an earthly people with an earthly destiny. They have a, 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 an earthly inheritance in the land that God promised them. But our destiny is heavenly. We are part of the bride of Christ, and we will rule and reign with Christ. But our, our citizenship, as Paul says in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, We are a heavenly people. Now, this is being challenged a lot today from different groups, but especially by the by the progressive dispensationalists. So this is another area in which they get a little a little fuzzy and a little bit off base. Now, one of the things that I'll talk about next time, I'll come back. We'll go back to John 14, review this just a little bit, so we get it again into our minds before we go forward looking at the at the next passages but that this is focusing on our, our, our position in Christ. We go to a dwelling place. We go to an abode that Jesus has prepared for us in heaven. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening, to be reminded that Scripture interconnects with other Scripture. We compare Scripture with Scripture to find illumination and elucidation, and it gives us great comfort to know that when we die there, that's not the end. When our loved ones die, it's not the end. Uh, The body may go into the grave, but the immaterial part, the soul and the spirit, is immediately face to face with you, and that that immaterial part will be reunited with a physically resurrected body that has some sort of continuity with our present physical body. We don't understand that. We don't know how that works. But there is a definite connection between what what we have today and what we will have in the future, just as Christ's physical body was connected to his present resurrection body. And Father, we pray that you would help us to understand these things, that we may be able to comfort those around us who go through loss, who go through times of uh, death, death of loved ones and friends, 
that we may comfort them with the truth of Scripture. And we pray this in Christ's name.